Let me just read it. Mark chapter 12, verse 38 through chapter 13, verse 2. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the saganogs and place of honor and ba at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of a Parents say long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. 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 He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples to start to them and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Thank you, Frankie, for reading. Well done. Our sermon title this morning is a question. It's what makes giving valuable. Have you ever thought about that? What makes a gift valuable? Uh, is it the uh, gift that is given? Is it the amount that is given? Is it the cause to which it is given? Is that what makes it valuable? In our scripture this morning, uh, Jesus lifts up a destitute widow and says that even though she has only given two small copper coins, which is about the equivalent of a penny, he says that her gift is worth more, that it's more valuable than all the other gifts that were given, all the other gifts combined. And notice he says she put in more than all those who were contributing to the treasury. So when it comes to Jesus' scale, her two copper coins outweigh all the other gifts that were given out of abundance. He says that her giving is an example of valuable giving. So let's dive a little deeper this morning and explore why her gift is valuable in light of the surrounding biblical context, some of which Frankie read for us this morning. First, her gift is valuable because it, it gives life. It gives life. Her gift is life-giving to her and to all who saw it and to all who read and remember her gift. It's life-giving because in giving the two small copper coins, uh, in giving all she had, she embodies Jesus' teaching on cross-bearing as found a little earlier in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 34 to 35. There we read that he called the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. You see, the, this poor widow is, is vastly different from the scribes that were denounced by Jesus just before the widow enters our field of vision in the story. The scribes had used their religion for sordid gain. They had ingratiated themselves to the wealthy, uh, to the very same people that were dropping large sums of money into the temple treasury. Uh, these scribes were not giving life to others. Rather, they were destroying life. We're told in particular that they were devouring uh, widows' houses. Um, the Greek word translated devouring there suggests an action of consuming completely. In financial matters, a devoured victim would be left penniless. Could it be that the destitute widow who gives those two copper coins is a victim of the religious elite of Jesus' day? 
We don't know, but the question is there. Scholars are not sure exactly the nature of this devouring of widows' houses, what the exact nature that this took. Uh, But what is without doubt is that it was a serious breach of trust and it was a violation of biblical law. Widows, right, along with orphans and sojourners or foreigners living in Israel, were the most vulnerable and dependent people in ancient Israel. They were entitled to unique protection under biblical law. It was forbidden to afflict a widow. Uh, There were all sorts of safeguards to ensure a widow would not become destitute and starve. And so the widows and orphans and immigrant strangers, they were to be cared for by the larger community. God promised to bless those who gave generously to their needs. The scribes have violated these laws, and their lengthy prayers are a cover-up for their violations. You see, the widow's giving was faith working through love, while the scribes' actions reflected a hollow religion. The form was present, but it had no spiritual content. So Jesus lifted up the widow's offering as valuable giving because for Jesus, valuable giving is costly. He says this in verse 44, For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Her giving cost her something. So valuable giving uh, gives life, and valuable giving is costly. Jesus says the value of the offering is best measured against the financial worth of the offerer. Now we might say, perhaps with a little more naivety, that the quality of an offering is best measured as a percentage of total assets, or a percentage of total income. Now, a recent survey revealed that on average, Christians today give 2.5% of their income to churches. But during the Great Depression, they gave 3.3%. Think about that for a moment. It's kind of crazy to think about that. That depression error giving was higher than it is now. It seems like we live in an era of great wealth and opportunity, even in the midst of the challenges we all have been facing this past year, right? We might think that people would give more than back in the Great Depression. And there's lots of reasons why that is not the case. Less than 10% of Christian church-going Americans give 10% or a tithe or more of their income to Christian and charitable causes. And those who do tithe tend to be in better financial shape than those who don't, right? So debt is one of the things that keeps people from giving generously. And it's something that we could work together on as a community of faith to minister to people, to help them get out of debt. When it comes to giving to support our mission to be a Christ-centered community, sharing God's love with the world, we can ask ourselves, how much does it cost? If it costs us little or nothing, if we do not miss the money we give, can we say our giving is valuable? There was a film back in 2016 on Netflix called The Fundamentals of Caring. And in this film, there's a very sad scene in which Trevor, a a disabled teen, confronts his long-lost father, a man who abandoned his family when Trevor was born. And the father has little to say to Trevor, but in a pathetic attempt to make amends, he he grabs a few hundred dollars from his wallet and he offers it to Trevor, Trevor. And in the movie, the son is crushed, and rightfully so, right? You know, we, we revile the absent father who throws money at his children because the money doesn't have any value, right? Not not real value, at least, because It doesn't involve the human heart and soul because that father to Trevor in that movie did not have a relationship with the son. He didn't value his relationship with the son. And so valuable giving gives life. It's costly and it values relationships. Relationships with others and relationship with God. A year ago, um, I had the delight of making Halloween cookies for for Wendell's Halloween party in his class. 
And you know how the kids in a non-COVID time, during that time, they would walk around, uh, they'd have their parade, and then they would return to their class for some refreshments. And one little girl at his table ate uh, uh, what was on her plate, including a cookie I made. And then she went later for a second cookie. But the second cookie she took was store-bought. And she took one bite and put it down and said it wasn't any good. Now, I wanted to say to her, but I didn't. I didn't say this, but I thought this. So this was my thought process at that time. And I knew enough not to put my foot in my mouth to keep it shut. But I wanted to say, you know, young lady, it's not any good because it didn't have all the love and the care and the concern put in that first cookie. You know, no, no one stayed up until 11.30 p.m. making the dough on Monday night. Nobody stayed up frosting that cookie until 11.30 p.m. on Tuesday night. You know, it, it didn't cost anyone anything. Okay, it cost the parent who bought it $5.99 at the grocery store. But those other cookies were full of love and care and concern because they were made by Wendell's dad. Again, I didn't say that to her. I just, I just thought it. And I'm not doing it to get any golden stars or anything. I, I did those things because I value my relationship, right, with Wendell. Think with me for a moment about the most valuable gift ever given. The, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God did not spare his own son because God values, God desires, God wants a relationship with you, with me, with all of humanity. And God valued, God values relationship with us so much that God was willing to give up Jesus' life for us that we might have life and to have it abundantly. As his followers, we're called to reflect God's image to the world. And when our giving is valuable, we reflect the character of God. The gift of salvation cost Jesus his life, but he gave his life that we might have life, that we might have a relationship with God. Now I'm going to throw some uh, next slide up here. It tells us that the word believe appears 273 times in the Bible. Pray, 371. Love, 714 times. But the word give, it appears 2,172 times. Now, Jesus talked about money and wealth more than any other topic. Our giving is ultimately about our relationship with God. Our giving is an opportunity to grow in our relationship with God. When we give, do we give enough that at times it leads us to place our trust in God? Or do we give a little here and a little there? Or do we give when we feel like it? Or do we give when we can after all the other bills have been paid and we have had a night out at the movies or maybe a night in, I guess? So movie theaters are open now. I don't know. Or do we follow the biblical instructions found in 1 Corinthians 16.2? On the first day of the week, each one should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his or her income. As we talk together this morning about stewardship, about giving, we are aware of the challenges of our times. Many have been affected financially by the pandemic. Others have not. So notice the instruction is set aside to keep a sum of money in keeping with one's income. All right, so this is an individual decision that each individual or family unit makes. And it's first and foremost about our relationship with God. It's a spiritual act. And so this week, each active church member or regular attendee listed in the directory will receive a stewardship letter and a commitment card. And we want each person to prayerfully consider the question, what is God inviting me to give in 2021 to financially support our mission as Grace Baptist Church of Bluebell? You know, perhaps there's someone out there uh, who's never made a commitment before, uh, has never made a, a regular weekly commitment to give to the mission and ministry of Christ's church. Maybe that person might choose to make a small, regular, weekly commitment. Maybe another person gives a, a certain percentage of income on a regular basis, and they might want to consider increasing their giving by a percent or two. And there may be some out there who 
can increase their giving to a tithe or even beyond a tithe, even beyond 10%. The important thing is that when we make that decision and when we give, we do so not what? Not reluctantly or under compulsion, but as 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, that each should give what each has decided in his or her heart to give, not reluctantly for what? God loves a what? Cheerful giver. Does our financial giving bring us closer to God? Does it lead us to trust God a little more because we've given to the point where we let go of our trust in material things and place our trust in God like the widow in our Scripture text? See, valuable giving does that. We grow when we participate in valuable giving. And so to recap, valuable giving gives life, is costly, values relationship, and lastly, valuable giving exalts God. In other words, valuable giving gives praise to God. The widow's offering exalted God because it was given in quiet and in secret. Well, until Jesus drew attention to her, of course. It praised God because it was an action of trust, an act of devotion to declare her trust in God. And that was in contrast to the display on the part of the scribes. And so we can ask, does our giving glorify God? Does it exalt God? I want to close our sermon this morning by returning to that story of little Hattie Mae Wyatt that Mr. Jenkins shared with the children this morning. You know, that 57 cents she gave, it was a valuable gift because one of the reasons it inspired others to act. In his sermon on the history of the 57 cents that Mr. Jenkins shared a part of, Dr. Conwell shared that it not only purchased, helped purchase the house that would be used for an expanded Sunday school program, but also that house which was purchased by the church was, the very, was where the very first classes of Temple University took place. And as Mr. Jenkins shared, when the original 57 cents, 54 were returned and they were used as a down payment towards the purchase of a lot on which Grace Baptist Temple was built in North Philadelphia. And so her gift reminds us of who are the really great in this world. The really great are not the mighty. They're not kings and queens. They're not the presidents. They're not the famous. They're not the celebrities. No, they are just people like you and me. People like Hattie Mae Wyatt who are willing to dream. She was a little schoolgirl living in one of the homes of the industrial, honorable, and upright and saving classes of society. She was not wealthy. They were not wealthy and great. And yet, think about how her life was used. Think what God did with her in the 54 cents. Think of this church and the influence of its membership going out and spreading over the world. Before I even came to Philadelphia, this church affected my life. When every year there would be an insert in my church bulletin growing up about chaplains, about the four chaplains, one of whom was a son of the pastor of this church at that time, who in World War I, was it World War II, one of the wars, gave his life jacket to someone else. Gave his life so that someone else, that always inspired me. And that's part of the heritage and story of this church. Think of the influence of this church's membership going out and spreading over the world of the influence of the Sabbath school carried out by the church over the years. Think of the institutions this church has founded. Samaritan Hospital. Right now, Temple Hospital, University Hospital. Or there was another hospital called the Garretson. Think of how in that Wyatt House were begun the very first classes of the Temple College. And that the Wyatt Might Society provided the seats, the books, and the teachers. In 1912, Conwell asked this congregation to think of the influence of that 57 cents for just a moment. And I invite you to do the same today, 108 years later. At that time, almost 80,000 young people had gone through classes of Temple University. That was when they dedicated that portrait of Hattie Mae Wyatt. Think where they and all the others who have gone through that institution are now. Think of the people who have gone into ministry because of this church. 
and the thousands of people who have heard the good news of Christ's love because Hattie Mae Wyatt invested her 54 cents because she laid the foundations and gave her life for it. It wasn't just her, though. Her act inspired others to act. Her act inspired others to put their faith in God. And I wonder this morning if her act and the acts of those who have gone before us, I wonder if they will inspire us to put our faith in God today. To dream big. Like Hattie dreamt. To think about what God has gifted this church, this community with in its people, in its location, in its land, and to dream big. Right? Dream big. That we would do all this not so that we would get praised, but that so that like little Hattie Mae Wyatt, that even though our life may be short, that it may still be complete. And that we may live really to be so old in the influences of our lives, the influences that our lives throw upon this earth. Amen.